Good morning, church family. It is so good to be with you here this morning. A quick show of hands, is anybody else feeling personally victimized by daylight savings time this morning? Um, because I, for one, am. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Garrett McCord. I'm the youth pastor here at FBC Bernie. And let me say that it is a blessing to get to serve as a youth pastor. It's such a pivotal time in teenagers' life. Uh, there's many statistics that show potentially as many eight, as 80 to 90% of believers actually place their faith in Jesus before the age of 18. And so it's a real blessing to get to speak into these students' lives and love on them in such a pivotal time when they're becoming who they're gonna be. Now, I will say, though, uh, as a youth pastor, I have found myself saying some things that I thought I would never have to. Uh, things like, no, you can't throw that full bottle of lighter fluid in the campfire. <laughs> or, or, no, you can't see how many teenage boys you can fit in a charter bus bathroom. Or my personal favorite, yes, you have to wear deodorant and shower every single day at church camp. Uh, I've said that one a lot. Um, but it's funny, though, because I've been doing youth ministry for about five years, but you talk to some of the guys who've been doing it for uh, 10, 15, 20, and you'll be really surprised at how jaded some of them are. You know, enough years of having kids break their trust or just altogether ignore them, and they start to think that they have it all figured out. And you can see that they've started to make up their mind about certain types of kids. You'll hear lines like, well, middle schoolers can't pay attention and high schoolers don't care to. Or, ah, yeah, they'll be all in until they get a taste of popularity sports or boys, and then you'll never see them again. Or, ah, just wait till they get their car keys, and then you won't see them until senior recognition. And what I've realized is that these guys have let their past experiences and hurt shape their future and present image of students as a whole. And what that does is it shapes their future interactions with them. And they start to form biases and prejudices against kids based on what crowd they run with, what school they go to, how they dress. And before you know it, they only give time to three or four students that they think are actually gonna turn out okay. And what happens is they get to this place where those biases and those prejudices start to close doors for the gospel before conversation can even be had. And the reason I share that story this morning is that we live in a world that's more divided than ever. Uh, you, you don't need me to tell you that, right? Most of you read that on your news feed this morning when you woke up. We see ethnic prejudice leading to a war and crimes against humanity in Europe. We see that same thing brewing on the other side of the world in China and in, in the Asian, um, Asian sphere of things. And then you obviously see it here at home. Um, I know that 2020 seems like it was a long time ago, but it was really only three years, and you've seen all the different um, racial divides, the, the political divides, the divides over um, different political stances, the, the, the COVID stuff, everything. It just feels like we're in this just constant state of anxiety and fear and division and anger. And as Christians, we're supposed to be above all of it, Right? But the more and more you see, the more hopeless it can make you feel, and it seems like we're being drugged into more and more conflict every day. And as we're drugged into more and more conflict, it's really, really hard to fight that us versus them mentality. Because being a believer, even you know, 50 years ago, was at once a place of honor. It was once a, it was once a place of honor. It was once a, a noble thing to do, and now it's the complete opposite. It's a, at least culturally, it's a place of shame. And so as we come under more and more attacks, it's really, really difficult not to form biases and prejudices against the camps that tend to throw arrows our way. And if we're not careful, we can form that us versus them mentality and we start to get jaded and closed off just like those youth pastors. So you have to ask, how can we avoid it? How can we above it? How can we show the love of Jesus like we're called to do in a world that seems like it doesn't want it? And as we've been walking through this series in Acts, prejudice has actually been a topic that's reared its head a few times. Uh, the first time we see it was in the conflict between the Hellenistic Judeo-Christians, which were the, the Jewish Christians who had accepted Greek culture, and the Hebrew Jewish Christians, the ones who had stayed more traditional. And they were having conflict over the serving of food because certain widows were getting neglected, and it re was really an ethnic thing at its core. And you see that that conflict ultimately led to the appointing of deacons. And then we've seen it as the gospel and the Holy Spirit moved to the Samaritans. The Samaritans were once this race that was hated by the Jews. They were seen as a half-breed. They were seen as believing um, just falsehood. And, and so there was this hatred. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes, and now they're a part of the family of God. And you see that bridge being uh, built, that, that gap being closed. 
And then you see it even when Paul has been saved, he's had his conversion, and the church is struggling to accept him because of all the terrible things that he's done. But now we arrive at the biggest divide yet in our text this morning, and that's the gap between the Jews and the Gentiles. And there's a question that's posed by this text is gonna run through everything we do this morning, and it's this. Is the gospel powerful enough to bring even the most sworn enemies together under the kingdom of Jesus? And just as importantly, does the gospel have the power to heal us from our own deep-seated biases and prejudices? And we're gonna find that answer in Acts chapter 10, verses one through 23 this morning. If you have your copy of scripture, please flip there with me. If you do not have a copy of scripture, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. That is our gift to you. We would love for you to have that, take it, write in it, mark it up. Um, and then also next to that Bible, you'll see that there's a little notepad that has little tear off sermon notes. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you would tear one of those off, use it throughout the message, um, take down should the Lord um, in his kindness show you anything this morning, any truth, anything that he um, wants you to walk in after this morning, write it down, take notes. Um, remember, the purpose of this morning is not purely information, but it's formation, right? That the Lord would show you something and that we would leave here looking more like Jesus. And saying that, we're gonna have some homework at the end that involves those sermon notes. So go ahead and grab onto those. We'll explain some more of that later. Uh, but we're actually gonna start reading starting in verse one. Verse one says, now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and made many charitable contributions to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had come in and had said to him, Cornelius. And he looked at him intently and became terrified and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and charitable gifts have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier from his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that even now, you would prepare our hearts for the truth that you would have for us. God, that you would meet us in this place, that you would shape us more into the image of your son, Jesus, and that as we leave here, God, we would be on mission, we would be lights for the kingdom. But help us to just give this time back to you, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, we love you, and praise things in Jesus' name, amen. And so right away, there's a new face that bursts onto the scene. Throughout Acts, you see a couple of recurring characters, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, but you get this new name, Cornelius. And it doesn't seem like we get a whole lot of info on him, except that he's a centurion and that he feared God. But if you do a little bit of digging, those two attributes actually tell you everything that you need to know. Because as a centurion in what's called the Italian cohort, I know that's a lot of words, that basically means that he was a soldier in the Roman army. Um, and for my military people, uh, a centurion was basically the equivalent of an NCO, or for my non-military people, a sergeant. And so he wasn't the highest on the totem pole, but he had authority, he had respect. But as a Gentile soldier serving a Gentile city, nobody would have expected Cornelius to fear God. Because as a Roman soldier, he had probably been well-traveled and he'd likely been exposed to all of the paganism and idol worship that Rome had to offer. He had status, and so he had access to all of the money, the power, the sexual immorality that he could want and chase after because of who he was in the military. But at some point, I imagine that he had seen all that Rome, all the idol worship had to offer, and he wasn't impressed. And then at some point along in his career, he must have encountered Judaism, whether it was there in this city or somewhere else, and he had to have been struck by their devotion to God. It must have caught him off guard, their monotheistic ideas, which I know is a, is a kind of a big word, but basically it just means how they believed in one God, which was completely countercultural for the day and age. And he was so struck that the text doesn't say that he became a believer or even like a convert to Judaism, but the, Luke writes that he had given a lot of charitable gifts to the Jewish community in the area, and he actually prayed regularly. And so he might not have found God, but he was clearly seeking him. And so why is all this detail included? Because as soon as Luke's audience in Acts found out that Cornelius was a Roman soldier, they would have made up their mind about him. 
He was the villain of the story. They would have seen him uh, as the occupier, a man of authority in the army that had oppressed God's people. He had taken their land, he'd stolen their money and done all sorts of terrible things. They would have been absolutely shocked that God chose Cornelius, of all people, to give a vision and be a part of his plan. But the reality is Cornelius wasn't the the villain. That wasn't who he was at all. He was genuinely seeking the Lord. Like we just said, he, he might not have found him yet, but he cared for God's people. He met needs in the community regularly. He prayed continually. And if you think about it, Cornelius was actually closer to God than the Pharisees. He was doing their job better than they were. Think about that. Somebody who culturally is supposed to be the furthest from God is actually the closest. And some of the people who are supposed to be culturally the closest to God are actually the furthest. And so what does this have to say to us this morning? Well, I think the principle is that in God's kingdom, status and cultural background have nothing to do with spiritual health. And that should be a warning for us in two ways. First, we shouldn't lean on our own upbringing or inclusion in a church culture as a source of spiritual health. Let me, let me expand on that just really quick. Many of us here have been raised in a church home. You have Baptist bones. You've been to more potlucks and eaten more casseroles than you can count and praise the Lord for that, right? That's not a bad thing. I got a good amen on that one. But being raised in that way in culture doesn't mean you just spiritually coast for the rest of your life. You're still called to faithfully follow Jesus. Your upbringing, the, the culture you came up in, while it's a blessing, it's not the substance of your faith. Your parents' faith, your grandparents' faith, it's not your faith. We're called to have our own. We're called to faithfully follow Jesus and not just gain a lot of information about him, but be more and more formed to his image throughout our entire life. That's God's will for us as believers. Two, we should be careful before we typecast other people based on their cultural background. And just in case you think that this is something that doesn't happen anymore, we were actually at a wedding uh, two weekends ago, so not this weekend, but the last weekend, and um, there's this speech where the, the... the father of the bride is um, you know, doing his thing and he's kind of opening up, thanking everybody who's come from all over the place and he's calling out states and he goes, oh, you know, we have some people here from Oklahoma and you hear some cheers. Oh, we have some people here from Louisiana and you hear some cheers with a twang. And uh, he finally gets to, oh, and we have some people here from California and crickets, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to say they're from California. And of course, we're sitting with some people from our table, and we know that these people are from California, and so we look at them, obviously kind of joking right, and the husband just goes, don't look at me, y'all, we're Texans. And then he leaned over, and he's like, did I say y'all right? Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> and we joke, and, and you know, we, we, we laugh, but if you, you really think about it, if you talk to people who've moved here recently from another state, and I know some of you here in this room The reason you don't share is not because you're ashamed of where you've come from. It's typically because of the preconceived notions and hostility that people here in Texas have about people that move from those states, right? We've created in our minds this image of what somebody from California is like, and it's typically not positive. But guess what? It's not always true. Those people at that table, they're wonderful people, right? And if we're not careful, those preconceived notions and hostilities, they can shut doors before we even get a chance to walk through them. We have to be so, so careful, just like I talked about states, but we can't assume where people stand with the Lord or their willingness to receive the gospel based on superficial attributes, where they're from, what church they go to, even how they vote. Because when you fail to do that, you've given Satan a foothold in your life in the form of discrimination. That's where that road leads. Nobody just wakes up and decides that they're gonna hate a whole class of people. It starts with harboring ideas that are born from falsehood. Like it's not reality, but we let it shape how we go about everyday life like it is reality. And a discriminatory heart and service for the Lord are not compatible. And so something has to be done. And we actually get a picture of this as Cornelius sends his men to go get Peter because he's received this vision. God tells him, hey, go find Peter um, and, and bring him here. And so that happens. And so let's start reading up in verse nine. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and wanted to eat. And while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down 
lowered by four corners to the ground. And on it were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky. And a voice came to him and said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. And so Cornelius had sent his men to go fetch Peter um, and, and then the scene shifts to the next day and Peter is praying. It's around lunchtime and he starts to get hungry. And so he receives a vision similar to how Cornelius just did, except in this vision, there's this large white sheet that came down with all sorts of animals on it. And the thing to note about the animals is there were both clean and unclean animals. Um, and, and if that seems foreign to you, what that really means is that in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament law, certain animals were designated as unclean. You weren't allowed to eat them. You had to avoid contact with them. And there's a voice in this vision that tells Peter to get up and eat, which confuses him because there's unclean animals here. And everything he's ever known up to that point is he's not supposed to do that. And so he refuses the Lord's command. He says, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And it happens two more times and the vision ends. And while on the surface, it seems like some weird, like hunger-induced fever dream, this is actually one of the most monumental moments in church history. Because on one level, God is removing the prohibition on foods, which is why you get to enjoy the divine blessing of bacon, right? It's monumental, one of my favorite moments in all the... But there's a whole different level that goes far beyond simply foods. Because even though his disciples didn't understand at the time, Jesus had actually declared all foods clean years ago. It's recorded in Mark 7. He says, uh, Mark 7, verse 18, and he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. And then there's a parenthetical that says, thus he declared all foods clean. And so there's something much larger that's happening. And, and what you need to know about it this morning is that there's a thread of cleanliness that runs all throughout the scripture. And in the old covenant, because of sin, there were things like ritual washings, abstaining from food, sacrifices, and all of that was required to be considered clean and to be able to approach the Lord because he is holy and we are not. However, in the new covenant, that's no longer the case because in the new covenant, what makes us clean and able to approach the Lord is the blood of Jesus. And so this is where you see that shift happening. And I'll admit, that's a very, very rough and short summary of this massive, I mean, the reason we're involved in the church. Like, this is huge theologically. And Daniel's actually gonna go much more into depth on that next week. But where I wanna camp this week is a third shift that's happening here, and that's actually what God is doing in the heart of Peter. Because you would have thought that Peter, after hearing this, would have just immediately responded at this point, right? Like, I thought we were to the part in his character arc where he's just doing whatever God says. Like, I think we're past the whole disobedience, right? But no, he, he pushes back. He says, by no means, Lord. In fact, he had to be shown the vision three times, which you would think, at this point in Peter's life, he would understand the whole three times thing but he doesn't. And there's something going on here that even though Peter thought he was just trying to avoid eating an unclean animal, the Lord was doing something in his heart and he was using this vision to, to show him something that was there that he was missing, a blind spot. Even though he thought that he was just trying to avoid an unclean animal, the Lord was showing him his heart towards people who were previously considered unclean, specifically the Gentiles uh, there's a quote from Ken Hughes who explains this perfectly. It'll be up on the screen. It says, the four corners of the sheet in the vision correspond to the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. The sheet's contents indicate the swarming millions that populate the earth. Cornelius, all his soldiers, all his servants, all the Roman people, all other nations on the face of the earth, all mankind were bound up together in one loathsome bundle. And Peter was standing above them, surveying them, and spitting out revulsion and rejection. Peter was about to see in living color his cold attitude towards the world, or at least towards non-Jews. Teeming millions were stone blind spiritually, and yet Peter's callous reply was surely not, Lord. And as you trace the, the history of this moment, you see that Peter was just one in a long line of prejudice that went all the way back to Abraham. A great example of this prejudice is found in Jonah. 
And, and I don't think it's a coincidence. You know where the house that Peter is staying in is located? Joppa. You know the last time you see Joppa in scripture is where Jonah ran to to catch a ship to avoid witnessing to the Ninevites because he hated them. He hated their race. He hated everything about them. And then, you know, there's a little detour where he gets thrown off and then swallowed by the belly of the fish in three days, spit out on dry land. And you thought he would have learned his lesson, but then he goes and he witnesses to them and he's mad at God when they actually repent instead of facing judgment. And even during Peter's time, Jewish midwives were actually forbidden to help a Gentile woman in childbirth because doing so would be considered helping multiply the Gentile scum. A slur that was regularly used for Gentiles by Jewish people was goyim, it meant the nations, and uh, while it seems pretty tame to us, it was, it was akin to some of the slurs we have in our, our time and our culture today. But it wasn't just the practicing Jewish people. This idea of prejudice towards the Gentiles had crept into the early church. And so now you see, yes, there's this large theological movement here, but God is also shaping Peter's character. It was work that had to be done before the gospel could spread because there was no part in God's kingdom for that prejudice. He was forcing him to come face to face with the biases and prejudices that were deep side, deep inside his heart. And, and unless you run to the place, we can so easily like make Peter the whipping boy in scripture, right? It's really easy to pick on Peter, but in reality, we're not much better. We all have our own biases, our prejudices, whether we know it or not. A lot of them are blind spots. Some from our parents, grandparents, some of our own making. We take entire people groups and decide they're too far gone, why even bother? And, and now I know that we would never probably verbalize that, but it's shown in our actions, right? You think about who you're typically prone to go and share the gospel with. A lot of times it can really start to become people that look and think like us. And sometimes it's big and obvious, it's ethnicity, it's political affiliation, but sometimes it's far more subtle. It's how someone dresses, how someone chooses to educate their children, what shots someone decides to get, how they spend their money, their stance on alcohol, their stance on worship music. We are very creative when it comes to finding ways to judge people. I, I speak as one who's, who's guilty myself and I think the reason that we're so prone to do this, why our flesh is so bent towards stereotyping and prejudice is because honestly, it's just easier. It's so much easier to just take people and throw them into buckets of categories than deal with all the deep complexities that make us human, all the contradictions. Because when you don't stereotype someone, you have to actually get to know them. You have to do the hard work of taking the good with the bad that exists in every single one of us because that's a human condition. We have these competing desires. I could go on a whole rabbit trail with that. What happens is when we, when we let that mindset take over, we start to let those biases influence our thinking and we start to make up our mind about who is worth loving. Just like those old youth pastors in that opening illustration, if we're not careful, we write off entire swaths of people made in the image of God just because we think we have them all figured out. We think we know how they're gonna respond and we don't bother. And I don't know about y'all, but it's a scary, scary thought to think that I might punt one day on the opportunity to lead someone to salvation because I avoided them based on something so petty. We might not understand or agree with everybody, but we should agree that the gospel is for everybody. And I think that's what God's trying to get Peter to see here. And so how do we move forward? I don't, I don't wanna just camp out and, and leave here and be like, all right, you guys have a good morning now that we're all super depressed and beat up. There's hope. Praise God, there's hope in this passage uh, because if we're honest, we do come to the table with plenty of deep-seated biases and divisions in our souls and we know that that kills our effectiveness to work for God's kingdom. So what do we do? Well, so far in Acts, and I alluded to this earlier, we've seen the gospel cross all sorts of boundaries. And this is obviously the biggest one without a doubt. Uh, and the gap for the Samaritans even was, was just tiny compared to this one. There's, there's thousands of years of division and hatred. Like if, if you were a Jewish person in this day and age, you viewed Gentiles as just, they weren't even on your radar as people a gospel might go to. They were no better than barbarians or animals. So all the hate, all the animosity, we have to ask, is the power of the good news of Jesus enough to tear down that wall? So let's start and read in verse 17. 
Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might mean, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius had asked directions to Simon's house, and they appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous man and a God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. And so he invited them in and gave them lodging. And so if the question from the text is, is the gospel power and powerful enough to bridge this divide, the answer is yes. Because Peter's sitting there, he's trying to put together what in the world he just saw, and the men from Cornelius show up and they tell him why they came, and Peter invites them in. And while that might just seem like a normal little detail, typically a Jewish man would have never invited Gentiles into his home and spent time with them or stayed with them overnight because it would have made him unclean being in the presence of unclean people, unclean food. And and it's huge. It shows this change of heart, but we really see Peter's change of heart in verse 34. And this is after he had gone to Cornelius, he had listened to what he had experienced, and he immediately responds. He opens his mouth, and Peter says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. It's a complete change of heart. And he even acknowledges that he was wrong. He said, I now know. I didn't before, but I now know that God doesn't show partiality. So why the change of heart? He was just confused by the vision. What happened on that rooftop that could undo thousands of years of prejudice, division, bitterness? I believe that it all goes back to the line that God told Peter after he said, by no means. He said, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. See, Peter realized that Jesus died for the Gentiles too. That Jesus' blood wasn't just for him or the people who looked like him or the people that shared his lineage. And if that was the case, who was he to discriminate against them? Who was he to withhold the gospel from them, especially if they shared the same faith and longing for God that he had? And let me tell you this morning that that same realization is key to overcoming our biases, our prejudices. Whoever it is that deep down in your heart you can't stand, you want no part of, you have to remind yourself Jesus died for them too. And if Jesus loved them enough to die for them, then who are you not to love them? Who are we to withhold the love that came at such a price? And that's the beauty of the gospel. It puts us all on the same level. We were all made in the image of God. We're all made as his image bearers, yet sin came in and corrupted that, all right? We we chose to disobey God, make ourselves king, and God is perfect and just, so he has to punish sin. And, And on surface level, none of us have a problem with that. We want God to punish sin. We want evil people to face justice. We just don't want our evil punished but we're all on the same level, we're all under wrath, but God didn't want us to be separated from him, so he sent his son Jesus to live the perfect life that we couldn't, fully God, fully man. And then on the cross, God took all of the wrath that we had stored up for our sin and he put it on Jesus. The the price for sin still had to be paid, but Jesus paid it for us in our place so that if we would place our faith in him as Lord and King, we'd be saved. And it's a salvation that has nothing to do with what we've done, who we've been, what we look like, what we sound like, it's just a free gift. And on the other side of salvation, there's this beautiful reality that Paul writes about in Galatians 3, 28, and he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this verse doesn't mean that we don't have any cultural differences or identities, we do. And and guess what, guys, that's been given to us by God. It's a beautiful thing that we're different. We're reflecting different pieces of his creation and his beauty in us. That's a good thing. But what this verse is saying is that we now have a higher identity in Christ that surpasses everything else. We might be different, but none of us are different enough that the blood of Jesus can't bring us together in love. 
And I don't know of a more beautiful picture of this in scripture than the one in Revelation 7, starting in verse nine and going through verse 10. Those verses read, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes, peoples, and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cried out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God, our God, who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And that's our future reality. That's what heaven's gonna look like. People from every single people group standing before the Lord, standing before Jesus in heaven, praising him. And you know what they're all saying? Salvation belongs to our God. They're united by how the blood of Jesus has saved them from their sins and given them eternal life. It's the shared characteristic between every single person that's there in that moment. And let me say, isn't that beautiful? Like seriously, like just try this morning to fight the cynicism that we've been living in for three years. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't your heart long for that? In a world where you wake up and you see hatred on the news and on Twitter and Instagram every single morning, doesn't your heart wanna be a part of that? With no anger, with no bitterness. Is that really what your heart wants? Let me ask an honest question this morning. Is that what your heart desires? every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, or if you're really, really, really completely honest this morning, are there some people you hope aren't there? And if that's the case this morning, my my prayer is not that you would feel shame. Conviction and shame are not the same thing. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit and it calls you to life. Shame is from Satan and it calls you to death. But I want you to be encouraged knowing that there's healing this morning. Because that bitter, that prejudice, that doesn't hurt anybody else. It's like drinking, it's the same thing they always say about bitterness. It's like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to die. It doesn't do anything to the person you're bitter about. I mean, it might, but, but ultimately it hurts your soul and you can be healed from that this morning. If you're guilty of the sin of partiality, prejudice and discrimination, with, let's, let's just be honest, we all have at some point, one way or another. Scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that we, he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And so as, as the band comes up and we move towards a close, um, here in the next few moments as we respond, I mentioned that we're gonna have some homework um, and there's this little pad of sermon notes. And I just want you here in the next few moments before we respond, to be really, really honest with yourself and God. Who is it in your life, in your sphere of influence, that you've said, by no means, Lord? Maybe it's a, let's be real, maybe it's an ethnic group. Maybe maybe it's somebody of a certain political affiliation. Maybe it's something far more subtle. Maybe it's an individual. I know we've been talking about broad things, but we have biases and prejudices against individual, individuals in our lives. Maybe because of past hurt. But whoever it is, I'm just gonna ask you, really, really be honest and write that down on that piece of paper. Now we're not gonna show this to anybody. We're not gonna have you put it in the drop box when you leave. But I just want you to take this with you and pray over it. Create a space in your next week for silence, solitude, and prayer, and ask, God, please soften my heart towards this person or these people. God, give me a burning desire to love them and share the gospel with them. Give me an opportunity to share the gospel for them. I mean, think about it. What better time than we're in the middle of this witness campaign where we are saying, hey, we know that in this, uh, in this time period leading up to Easter, people are prone to, to being invited to church, to hearing the gospel. They're more open than usual. What a better time to say, Lord, would you, would you show me my blind spots? Would you help me to go out of my comfort zone? Would you help me to go to people, God, that you want me to go to, but I might never on my own? And pray over that. And maybe this morning you've been wrestling with bitterness and division in your own life and you realize I have not made Jesus king. I don't have the peace of the Lord because I don't know the Lord. Well, what better time than this morning to make that decision? There is peace and healing on the other side. There there is living water for your soul that's so much more refreshing 
than anything this world has to offer. And it's available to you this morning. I shared the gospel earlier. If you would place your faith in Jesus as Lord, if you commit to follow him, make him king, then you'd be saved. And the rest of your life, what's gonna happen is you'll receive the Holy Spirit and God, in his kindness, little by little, will craft you more and more into the image of Jesus. And I'm not saying that life is gonna be easy. I'm not saying that people are all gonna love you all of a sudden. I'm not saying that difficult people we have to deal with are all of a sudden gonna be easy to deal with, but you'll no longer do it alone. And you'll no longer do it from your own strength, but you'll do it from the strength of the spirit inside of you. And that's the encouragement we need this morning. And so I'm about to pray, and I'm gonna ask you in these next few moments to respond, be honest with the Lord. If you, if you need to make that decision, if you need to make Jesus your king this morning, we'll have people down here to pray with you, to counsel you through that. Don't do that in a vacuum. And also, I just wanna say, don't let, I, I know we can so often, we stand up and we sing and we let this become something to kind of get us out of what the Lord's been doing in our heart and conviction. It's like, oh, well, I gotta sing now, or oh, I'll come up after this verse, or after this course. I tell my students this all the time. Don't let it be a pacifier. If the Lord's calling you to do something, if he's calling you to respond, be obedient. Because it's not to hurt you, it's not to shame you, it's for your good. If you're a believer, everything God lets happen to you is either for your good or to keep you from harm, even if it doesn't seem like it in the moment. So if he's calling you to do something, you can trust him that he's a good father and he just wants what's best for you. And so I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna respond, all right? Lord Jesus, we love you so much, we praise you. We thank you for this morning and your word, God. We, we admit that in our flesh, we are so bent to discriminate, we are bent to stereotype, we are bent to say by no means, Lord, to people we don't understand. Would you forgive us this morning? Would you help us to see the beautiful truth that God, you died for the world? God, would you help us to see beyond our own limited perspective and see more and more of your love for the nations and would we be inspired by that, God? to cross those boundaries, to bridge those gaps. We praise you that this event, God, happened, that, that we, Lord, as Gentiles, are now a part of your kingdom. We, we praise you for that, and we thank you, Lord. And I pray that we would not become conceited or prideful based on our culture, our background, Lord, knowing that we're all in the same boat. We're all in need of salvation that comes from you and you alone. And on the other side of that, there's freedom, there's love, there's unity. Lord, I pray for courage and boldness as we respond this morning. We love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, stand and respond.